Second Siege and Relief of Vienna, 1683. The efforts of Papal Nuncios in Warsaw and Vienna, combined with the aggressive intentions of the Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa, induced the Emperor Leopold I of Austria to sign a military alliance with King John Sobieski of Poland on 31st March 1683. The expected danger soon became reality. Nothing could withstand the great Turkish army, which swept through Hungary and into Austria in early July 1683, and under this threat to his capital, Leopold retired to Passau and entrusted the defense of Vienna to the iron willed Ernst Rüdiger von Starenberg and his energetic colleague, the Major Johann Andras von Liebenberg. On 14 July, the Turkish army formed a great semicircular camp about Vienna, and within a few days, a maze of trenches warmed towards the Lödel and Burg bastions on the southwest side of the city. The Burg Revelen, standing between these two bastions, became the chief object of the Turkish attentions, and following the explosion of a mine on 12 August, the ruins of this one outwork were erupted by a continuous series of mines, countermines, storms and sorties, until, on the night of 2nd September, the Turks finally established themselves as masters. The Turks had already succeeded in blowing a wide breach in the Lerbel Bastion itself, before a rocket from the Kalenberg showed the Viennese that relief was at hand. From Passau, the Emperor Leopold has sent appeals to the King of Poland and the electors of Saxony and Bavaria. The expulsion of the Turks was all the more urgent, as Tartar and Turkish horsemen were already devastating the countryside as far up the Danube as Melk. But by 7 September, the whole Christian army was assembled upriver from Vienna on the plain of Thurn. On the early morning of 12 September, the Christian forces drew up in line of battle on the southeastern slopes of the Wienerwald, with the left extending to the Danube, below the Leopoldberg. Below them, they could see the masses of the enemy army assembled on the heights between Nussdorf and Dornbach, with the great bow of the Turkish camp extending beyond Vienna. Duke Charles of Lorraine, the commander of the Christian left wing, conceived the plan of rolling up the Danube flank of the enemy, and after attending mass with the king, and other generals in the chapel of St. Joseph on the Kalenberg, he set his troops in motion for the Nussberg. After a bitter struggle for the height, the Turks fell back to the fortified village of Nussdorf, only to be driven across the Schreiberbach with the help of an Austrian battery planned on the newly captured Nussberg. By noon, the Christian left and center was established in Heiligestadt and along the Grinzingbach, although the Poles on the right had to take somewhere longer to negotiate the broken country around Dornbach and were still further delayed by Turkish counterattacks, in particular a violent assault directed against the Galinzinberg. The Turks had been forced to fall back to the line, extending through Breitensee through Otakring, Weinhaus and Dublin to the Danube below Heiligenstadt, and by the middle of the afternoon the Christian army was ready to strike a decisive blow. Yet again, Lorraine led the advance, and the Christian left once more broke the Turks on the side of the Danube. Lorraine had now penetrated the Turkish camp, but rejecting the temptation of plunder, he wheeled his wing to the right and rolled up the enemy flank in the direction of Wehring. The Saxons rushed the large earthwork of the Türkenschanze before the sixth cannon could be depressed to bear on them, and Sobieski, Dal the Coupe de Grace by launching his 20,000 cavalry in a charge from the meadows between Breitense and Hernals. The garrison of Vienna beat off one last fanatical storm of the enemy, and early in the evening they received their deliverers into the indescribable ruin of their defenses. For Austria, the siege of Vienna was the introduction to a decade and a half of war in the east, but all Christendom, with the exception of the French court, could rejoice in the survival of Europe's bulwark against the Turks. At the present day, the course of the ring road around the first district follows the outline of the fortifications, which were leveled in 1858 
and each band corresponds to the projection of one of the old bastions. Thus, the Lerwe bastion on the side of the Volksgarten is commemorated by the term in the Dr. K. Renner ring opposite the parliament. The Borg Revelin probably stood a few yards south of the statue of Archduke Charles in the Heldenplatz. An impression of the glasses is still conveyed in the open spaces of the Rathausplatz, the Maria Theresienschplatz, and the Stadtpark, sloping down to the Little River Thrin. The Grand Vizier had his tent near the Church of St. Ulrich, on a site now occupied by numbers 32 to 34 Neustitzgasse in the 7th district. Other objects of interest within the Innere Stadt are the Mölker Bastion, opposite the university, the only remnant of the old fortifications. A 79th pound ball fired into the city on 20th July, which is now preserved in a niche next to the door of number 3 Sterngasse. The tower of the Minoritenkirche, behind the chancellery, still lacking the spire that was shot away in 1683. Number 7, Amhof, was the house of Liebenberg, who died just before the relief of the city. The nearby arsenal, Zeughaus, held much of the ammunition of the defenders and was imperiled by the accidental burning of part of the Schottenstift, which now contained the tomb of Starenberg. The cathedral of San Stefan was struck by nearly 1,000 of the 100,000 cannonballs which the Turks fired into Vienna, and many of the missiles are still embedded in the walls. One of these balls is shown in the south tower, likewise a small bench from where Starenberg is said to have seen the approach of Sobieski's army. Here also hangs the Pumerin, the great bell first made from Turkish cannon in 1711 and recast from the old metal after the fire of 1945. On the outskirts of Vienna, the Türkenschatzpark in the 18th district takes its name from the earthwork erected against the relieving army. The chapels on the Leopoldsberg and the Kahlenberg were rebuilt after the battle and dispute the claim to the site of the famous mass on 12th September. The more recent historians, however, decide in favor of the Church of St. Joseph on the Kallenberg.